Hello, 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 and welcome to another fun-filled edition of the Cardio Business Fundamentals Lecture Series. I'm your host, Michael Rice. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy, happy Friday. I hope you all are having an absolutely wonderful start to your weekend. I hope you're having a great morning so far. Uh, this is a bit of an early one for a lot of us here in Cadio. We normally do our lectures a little bit later in the day, but I figured this would be best to give our UK members a chance to catch one during a normal hour. Um, and also a small group session for this kind of lecture is really nice. Um, so today, we are going to be talking about um, a subject that a lot of people have a lot of confusion on. And we're also going to be talking about a subject that a lot of people get really worried about. So today we're talking about profits and taxes. Um, so these are the two things that uh, we both desire in business and also the thing that we fear in business. And I hope that throughout the course of this lecture, we'll be able to break it down for you guys in a way that makes you even more excited about profits and even less worried about taxes. So without further ado, let's get right into things here. The first thing that we need to do is uh, when we're talking about profits, we need to have a little bit of a vocabulary lesson, okay? A lot of uh, new business owners will confuse these two words right here. They'll confuse the word profit with the word revenue. And this is a super simple concept, and it's okay if you've been confused on this in the past, but here's the difference. Your revenue is the total amount of money that your business brings in. So if you sell a pair of sneakers for $100, that's $100 in revenue. Your profits are the total amount of money that your business earns. So if you paid $50 for that pair of sneakers and you sold it for $100, you would have $50 in profit. So that's the difference between profit and revenue. Revenue is the total amount of money your business brings in. Revenue is the total amount of money your business brings in, where profit is the amount of money your business earns right? So once again, to give you an example, let's say you buy a pair of Bravest shorts from subsection and you pay $35 for that pair of Bravest shorts. And then you turn around and you sell that pair of Bravest shorts for $110. Your revenue in that case would be $110. And your profit in that case would be $75. Make sense? Sound good? Really easy one to start off with really really easy concept so revenue is the total amount of money you bring your business brings in and profit is the total amount of money your business earns now when we talk about profits we need to kind of get a little bit more specific right we have gross profits and we have net profits net profits are the amount of money that you earn when all the costs have been subtracted when everything is said and done, when you subtract your cost of goods, when you subtract your overhead, when you subtract your cost of labor, when you subtract all of the costs out of your business, the amount of money that's left over is considered to be your net profit. That's the total amount that you earned when all the costs were spoken for. Your gross profit can be defined a couple of different ways but typically it is just the amount of money that you earned after your cost of goods. So I'll give you an example here. Let's say you buy that pair of Bravest shorts from subsection for $35 and you sell it for $110, right? Your gross profit in this case would be $75 because you only paid 35 for the shorts, right? However, you're also likely gonna have to pay to ship that pair of shorts. So maybe you have $10 there, bringing your net profit down to 65, and maybe you had to pay $5 in gas to drive to the post office. That brings your net profit down to 60, and maybe after you subtract the cost of the shipping materials and your overhead, et cetera, et cetera, you're left with around $50 in net profits. So, to reiterate, gross profits, are the amount of money you make after subtracting the cost of goods 
and I'm going to put typically here because some people define this a different way. And net profits are the amount of money. I guess is the amount of money, right? Gross profits. Well, gross profits are net profit is, right? Yeah, net profits are the amount of money your business makes after subtracting every cost associated with the transaction. So, is this making sense so far? So we've gone over two things so far. We have our revenue. That's the total amount of money that our business brings in. And then we have our profit. This is just the amount of money that we earn. Our gross profit is the amount of money we earn once we subtract the cost of goods. And our net profit is the amount of money we earn after everything is all said and done. So after we pay for every cost of doing business, the amount of money we're left over is our net profit. Okay, the last little piece of vocabulary that we need to get into to understand profits are these words. And again, a lot of people use these words interchangeably when they all kind of mean different things. The word margin, the word markup, the word ROI or the acronym ROI. And all of these things mean something slightly different. So for example, your profit margin is the percentage of the sales price that your business earns right? So the profit is the amount of money that your business earns. So your profit margin is a percentage of the sales price that your business earns. So we'll give you a super simple example. Let's say you buy a pair of Air Forces from subsection for $65, okay? And your sales price for that pair of Air Forces was 110 So if I take this $65 that I paid and I divide it by 110 I can see my cost of goods was essentially 60%. That means my profit margin would be 40%, right? Because the $65 that I paid was 60%, basically, of the 110 that I sold it for. That means that the remaining percentage is my profit margin. I'll give you another example here. Let's say you paid $100 for a spider hoodie and you sold it for 180. Well, you would take the 100 or sorry, you would take the $100 that you paid and you would divide it by the sales price of 180 and you would see that your cost of goods is 55%. That means that your profit margin was 45%. That's the amount of the sales price that your business earned in gross profit. Now, your markup is kind of similar, but it is the amount that you're adding on to your cost of goods in order to be able to produce a profit. There are a couple of different ways of doing it. There are cost plus models, there are uh, price minus models, things like that. But essentially, your markup is the amount of money that you charge in addition to your cost of goods. So let's say, for example, I don't want to have to deduce a specific sales price based on market value, but I paid $100 for a product and I want to add 33%. I would have a markup of 33% on that item, leading to a sales price of $133. So your margin and your markup are virtually the same thing, where margin identifies the percentage of the sales price that you profited, and markup identifies the percentage you marked up that product in order to produce a profit. Finally, we have this term, ROI. This stands for return. Whoops, spelled that wrong. Whoops, return on investment. So this talks about how much money you earned after you put money in. So let's say you put $1,000 into subsection credit, and when you sold all of those products, you were left with $1,800. That means that you had an ROI or a return on investment of 800 bucks. And again, we can find that percentage very, very easily. We take our $1,000, we divide it by our 1800 and we can see that our ROI was once again 45%. Does this make sense?
So the reason that we go through all of this vocabulary is it's a lot easier to understand this concept of profit when we use the right vocab, when we use the right words. So if, for example, I tell you subsection bases its prices by marking up its, uh, its products by 25%, then you'll understand that that means we take our cost of goods, we add 25% onto it, and then we sell those products. That's not the way subsection works, but it's a good example, right? Or if I say that subsection has a profit margin of 2.5%, then you understand that once everything is said and done, it means that we end up 2.5% ahead of what we put in. Or if I say we have a really great deal on Bravest Shorts, they've got an ROI of 65%, you'll know that that means that for every dollar that you put in, you'll end up with an additional 65 cents. All sounding good so far? All making sense so far? Okay, awesome. So, obviously, obviously, our goal in business, our goal in business is to try to make profit. That's why we get into business. We want that profit so that we can pay ourselves, so that we can lose the nine to five grind. We all get in, in one way, shape or form, to business in order to produce a profit. Here's where things get tricky. A lot of people don't understand that there is a cost of doing business beyond just your inventory. So let's talk about selling a pair of sneakers here for a minute, and let's look at how much it costs to actually do business. So, the first step to reselling a pair of sneakers, step number one is buy the sneakers, right? You have to actually have them. And this is your cost of goods, right? But even before step one, even before step one, step one A is you might have needed to use a cell phone or a computer to access products right? So you have a cost of doing business there. You needed a cell phone or a computer to access the products that you sold, right? Then you buy the sneakers themselves, and then those products are going to come in. And once they come in, there's a cost of storage, right? You, these sneakers are going to take up space in your home or in your parents' home, and that space has value, because that inventory is taking up space, this is considered an overhead cost because there must be a roof overhead to store those sneakers, right? In addition to that, there is going to be an opportunity cost. And we'll talk about this more in depth a little bit later on, but this is essentially you spending your money where it could have been spent on something else, right? So you're gonna have the opportunity cost of putting out your money. In addition to that, you might deal with something called depreciation. Depreciation. Probably spelled something like that, right? <laughs> you might be dealing with something called depreciation, which is what if the price of that pair of sneakers goes down while it's in your possession, right? So sometimes you deal with depreciation. Then you're going to have to sell those sneakers, right? So you're going to need to access a sales platform. Once again, this might be a cell phone, it might be a computer, it might be a tablet, it's going to require internet access or 5G, etc., etc., right? All of these things have a cost associated to them. Then you're probably going to have to package your products, right? And boxes cost money, tape costs money, packing material costs money, etc., etc., right? So these are going to be additional costs, shipping costs, right? Then you'll need to provide a shipping label, right? Shipping labels also are not free. This also requires money. Then you will need to transport the product to a shipping carrier, right? You'll need to transport the product to a shipping carrier. And finally, you're going to need to follow up with the customer which takes time, which is additional opportunity cost, right? So a lot of the times, we only think about buying the sneakers when we think about reselling sneakers, right? We only think about the cost of goods 
in reselling the sneakers. But there are a load of other costs. There are a load of other costs. Appreciation, right? There we go. Depreciation. Okay. There are a load of other costs associated with this. So when we consider the costs of doing business, what we end up realizing, and this is oftentimes depressing for folks, is that our profit is not nearly as high as we think it is. It's not nearly as high as we think it is. In fact, sometimes we could find ourselves on what we consider to be a very good deal, we can find ourselves losing money. For example, if you buy a pair of sneakers for 100 bucks and you turn around in one day and you sell it for $110, you are not going to be able to cover the cost of shipping and your time and the storage and potential depreciation and the opportunity cost, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on only $10 of profit, right? This is where a lot of sneaker resellers start to get very confused because they'll say, wait a minute, I bought this pair for 80 bucks, I sold it for 90 bucks, yet somehow the amount of money in my bank account isn't going up, right? Because they forget about all these other costs of doing business. They forget about all of this. And this starts to feel very, very depressing, right? So before I get into why this shouldn't feel depressing for you, does this make sense that there's a lot of cost of doing business that isn't just the cost of goods? Megamind asks, you know if the item you're holding goes down in sale under retail, do you sell it or keep it? That kind of depends on where your business is. I would assume that most people in this lecture chat right now have relatively low capital positions. If you have a lower capital position and you're kind of like struggling with uh, money, then what I would recommend is that you sell that product immediately, recoup the money so that you aren't facing the opportunity cost of having money tied up in a losing product. Because you can reinvest into a winning product pretty fast. And if you reinvest into a winning product quickly and you sell it quickly, that kind of raises your capital more than the loss would by holding on to that product for too long. Okay. <coughs> so we have all of these costs of doing business. In order to really understand this, we also need to keep in mind that there is a labor cost associated. So we need to talk about these two terms here, opportunity cost and labor cost. So I want to give you guys an example here that illustrates opportunity cost. Okay, let's go through an example that illustrates opportunity cost. I'm going to give you two examples. This is opportunity cost one, and this is opportunity cost two. In example one, we have a traditional businessman, right? This person takes $1,000 and invests it into the stock market, right? This investment returns on average 10% per year. This person locks their money for one year to see a 10% return. Does this make sense? Now, let's compare this to a reseller, right? The reseller. This person takes $1,000 and invests it into inventory for their business. This inventory sells for a prof for an ROI of 5% per cycle. This reseller averages 1.5 cycles per month. Now, this person locks their money and let's say this person decides to lock their money for 1 year. Let's see how that would break down. So, this person's going to see a 5% return. So he's only getting half as much as the stock market guy, right? He's only getting half as much, but let's see how this breaks down. So first, if he does 1.5 cycles per month, that's 12 times 1.5. This is how many 5% cycles he's going to have. So there's going to be 18 5% cycles. So in month one, he's going to take that $1,000, multiply it like this, and he's going to have $1,050. Month two, 
multiply it like this, and he'll have $1,102. Month three, multiply it like this, he has $1,157. So you can see that by month three, the reseller has already beaten the traditional businessman. He's already beaten it because of exactly what Metanoia said. His money compounds. And the reason that his money compounds is he's not accepting the opportunity cost of locking his money for an entire year. When this traditional businessman invests into the stock market, he understands that he will not be able to access that capital for a year if he wants to see his profit. When the sneaker reseller locks their capital, they're locking this for maybe a month in their inventory before they're going to see the return on the investment. And if you move in especially fast selling inventory or certain hype products, you're maybe going to lock it for a couple of days before you see a return on your investment, right? So an opportunity cost is whenever you are putting money in somewhere that prevents you from putting money somewhere else. In this case, the traditional businessman has locked himself away from his money, putting it into the stock market, where the reseller is giving himself access to the money a lot faster. So even though the reseller might be seeing a lower percentage return, the reseller is able to cycle it more often, which makes it compound, which makes it overall more profitable. Does this make sense? Yes. Wonderful. So would you say pull money out of stocks? I believe that the stock market is a really good investment for when you are too busy to work for your money. If you are so busy that you cannot spend your money in an effective way, that's when you should put it into the stock market, right? That's when you should do it. So if, Noel's you right now are in a position where you say, I'm working a full-time job, I've got kids to take care of, I have my sneaker reselling business, and I have so much money, I cannot spend it effectively. That's the point where I would say, put it into real estate, put it into stocks, put it into a savings account, right? Put your money there, because then it's going to grow without you having to do a thing. Obviously, the reseller is applying labor and skill, which is allowing him to make more money where this person doesn't have to apply any time whatsoever and the money's just going to come out in return, right? So if you have legitimately zero time to make your money grow, that's when you do this, right? But until then, you should be doing this. You should be doing something to the effect of a side hustle. Kind of makes sense? And to illustrate this even more clearly, let me ask you guys a question. Isaac, or, uh, Dan, if you took the next six weeks to design the best t-shirt you possibly could, if you took the next six weeks to design the dopest t-shirt you possibly could, do you think that you would end up with something that at least meets the status quo as far as a t-shirt's concerned? That at least meets the status quo? Definitely, right? So if you took the next six weeks and put that in. Now, Dan, if you were a really bad salesman, if you were a really bad salesman, how many t-shirts do you think you would sell in a month? How many t-shirts do you think you would sell in a month? If you, or sorry, in a year, let's say. Over the course of one year, if you were bad at selling them, how many do you think you'd sell? A hundred, maybe. Let's say four. Let's say four. That would be laughable right? If you spent six weeks of your life making the best t-shirt that you possibly could, and then you worked at it in your off time for a year, and you could only sell four, that would be really bad, right? Well, let's say it cost you 15 bucks to print the t-shirt, to like screen print the t-shirt, and you were selling them for $25, right? If I take that $15 and I divide it by 25, I have a 60% cost of goods, meaning I'm getting a 40% return on investment on my t-shirts. That 40% beats the shit out of the stock market, right? Now again, the stock market you don't have to work for, right? You don't have to design a t-shirt. You don't have to try to sell the t-shirt. You don't have to do any of that. That's the benefit. But even if you're a terrible salesman, even if you're an awful designer, 
you could sell four t-shirts over the co over the course of a year in which case you're seeing quadruple the returns of the stock market there's no point in investing that way until you have so much money that you can't think of anything else to do with it kind of makes sense yeah yeah now this is obviously not also considering the security that the stock market offers. This isn't considering global economic factors or anything like that. We're taking it real, real simple, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't have a retirement account. I'm not saying you shouldn't have investments. What I'm saying is that if you are looking to be wealthy, if you're looking to make your money work for you, you have to ignore those inherent risks and you have to invest into yourself. Nobody is going to make you rich but you. No one's going to make you rich but you. No one out there is ever going to make you a profit but you. You have to be willing to invest in yourself if you want to see good returns. Okay, so opportunity cost and labor cost. So we talked about opportunity cost. Let's talk about labor cost. So let's come back to this example here where we talked about the cost of doing business. We talked about the cost of doing business. I'm going to ask you guys in chat here, what percentage of the time that you're on your phone are you doing something related to reselling? So if you consider all the time you use your phone throughout the course of a day, what percentage of the time is it related to reselling? 80%, 5 to 10%, 50%, 25%, zero. Wow, Megamind's not doing any reselling. Plus you're paying a management fee for those stocks? You might, you might, yeah. Okay. So let's say it was 10% of the time. Let's say it was 10% of the time. So that means that your cell phone, the cost of your cell phone is eating up 10% of your business, right? 10% of the cost of your cell phone is actually a cost for your business because if not for that cell phone, you would not be able to do your business, right? So if you have a new iPhone that's worth about a thousand bucks, that means that you have a cost of $100 over the course of time that you own that phone and use that phone that is a cost of doing business, right? So let's say that you're going to own that phone for 10 months before you buy a new phone. If that's the case, it's $10 a month, right? It's $10 a month. Okay, then you actually have to buy the sneakers, which we all already know about. Then we have the cost of storage. If you had to rent the home you live in right now, what would it cost you monthly rent? Depending on your area, maybe twelve hundred bucks, maybe fifteen hundred bucks, maybe two thousand dollars, something like that. And those sneakers are eating up what percentage of your home? Let's say that it's three percent of your home. Three percent of two thousand dollars over the amount of time that those sneakers are going to live in your home is a cost of doing business. Then you have your opportunity costs that we just talked about. Then you have the risk of depreciation, which has to be factored into every pair. Then we have our access to a sales platform. Then we have the time in the packaging for those products, et cetera, et cetera. And when you finally get all the way through all of this, you then need to consider how much time you spent in order to produce that profit. And do you guys want to hear something a little bit shocking? You guys want to hear something a little bit shocking? If you were to consider the amount of time a successful business owner spends over the course of their first year in business, they typically earn less than minimum wage. Less than minimum wage in their first year of doing business, mind you. This is a successful business owner in their first year of doing business typically earns less than minimum wage in their first year of doing business. And that's a successful business owner. Now that sounds really shocking, right? That sounds really shocking. You're saying, why the hell would anybody do that? And this is kind of a third subject that we should talk about. So hopefully all of this, all of this should be depressing you like crazy, right? You should be saying, fuck, why the hell would anybody ever start a business, right? Why would anybody ever do this? There's so much cost involved and I'm going to earn less than minimum wage for a year. Why would I ever do that, right? Why would I ever do it? It's because of this concept access versus ownership. So I'll break this down in real estate terms because it makes it really easy to understand. What is the difference between paying rent 
and paying a mortgage. What's the difference between paying rent and paying a mortgage? Well, when you pay rent, when you pay rent, that money is going to somebody else and it will never return to you. You are paying rent for access to the property. You're paying rent. Very good, P Magnum. Very, very good. You're paying rent for access to the property. Whereas when you pay a mortgage, you are paying for ownership in the property. After 30 years of paying rent, what does that mean for you? It means nothing. You get nothing. Zero, zilch, nothing. After 30 years of paying a mortgage, chances are it's paid off. And now you own the home. Now, you still lose money in this trade. When you pay a mortgage, you will still lose money. Your home will depreciate in value to the point where you lose money, with very few exceptions. Obviously, there are some people in the like populated parts of California that ended up gaining money when they own their homes. Same thing for some very small like kind of case studies in the Midwest, things like that. But point being that most people will still lose money whenever they are paying for ownership versus access. The difference is 100% of the money you pay for access is lost, where only some percentage of the money you pay for ownership is lost. Access versus ownership is a big deal. And here's why it's such a big deal when we think about it in terms of business. For this first year, when we're breaking our back and we're paying all of these costs, who owns the end result? As the business grows, as the customer base grows, as the brand grows, as you become more notorious, who owns it? You do. You own it. You are building equity in your brand by taking a payment of less than minimum wage for the first year in order to be able to work for yourself and to own it. It's the same thing with rent versus a mortgage. The guy paying the mortgage is going to pay more money every single month for less house than the guy paying rent. And the guy paying rent's going to laugh at him, right? He's going to say, you have a shitty house and you're paying more money. Ha, 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 right? Meanwhile, the guy paying the mortgage at the end of his term owns the home. Where the guy paying rent at the end of his term owns nothing. It's the same thing with business. When you work a regular job, if you were to take on a minimum wage job, and you put your labor in, you are building a brand. You are building that business. You are building equity in that business. You're making it worth more than it would have been without your presence. And when you do that, you're building that equity. You're building that value for somebody else. When you do it within your own business, you own it at the end of the term. At the end of the day, when the customers come knocking, they're coming to knock on your door as opposed to another company's door. You can't be fired. You can work whenever you want. There's a lot of really great benefits to it, but it's this concept of access versus ownership that makes the opportunity cost and the labor cost subsidized because you would still have opportunity cost by working a full-time job. You would still have labor cost by working a full-time job. Your time is worth money and your money is worth money, right? Time is worth money and money is worth money. While the full-time job is going to give you better access to that money, owning your own business gives you ownership of that money. When you invest money into your business, you own the goods or services or branding or equity that you built. Whereas when you do it for somebody else's business, they own it. That's the difference. Does this make sense? And this should make you feel a lot less depressed about this idea of earning less money because you're building that over time. You're making it into something that's a lot more valuable than when you started. When you start off, you are really going to eat shit. You are really not going to have very many customers. You are going to have to wait a minute to earn your money. You are not going to earn as much money when you start off in business as you would earn working at a job. However, Every minute of time that you put into your own business is invested into something that you own. Every minute of time that you put into working for somebody else's business is an investment into something you don't own. 
you are creating value for somebody else, not for yourself. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, yep. Perfect. Okay. So we are going to take a five to six minute pause here to answer any questions you guys have. I want you all to type a question in chat so that we can kind of go through this and make sure that we understand it before we start talking about taxes. So what do you guys want to know about profit? What do you want to know about all of this? About profit, about margin, about access versus ownership, about equity, about all of that. What do you want to know about that stuff? I see some folks typing. What's the difference between an LLC and a co cooperation? Uh, did you mean corporation? Or do you mean co-op? Give people a second here to type. Not sure, but I've seen it around. What I'm asking is, did you misspell the word corporation? Or do you mean a co-op? Really like this lecture so far? Hell yeah. Something I've heard before is you have to consider the fact that a large percentage of businesses fail in the first few years. How do you adjust for the idea of risk? I guess some risk is always assumed. This comes down to the definition of success versus failure. So I'll give you like an example here that might seem really weird. Over the course of the last 60 days, Cadio has lost, pen and paper wise, $600,000, right? We've lost $600,000 in the last 30 days. So you could look at that and you could say, wow, that's a big failure, right? You could look at that and you could say that's a big failure. But you could also look at that and say, look at all of the liabilities that we cleared. Look at all of the market drama that we underwent and look at the new systems that are coming up in place. We've probably added two to three million dollars worth of market value by changing our systems and accepting that financial pen and paper loss, right? Now we can realize those advantages through executing on these systems, right? And it's something that every cycle has the ebb and flow of. So what we've been doing for the last couple of months and the reason that we lost money is because we used the money to build right? We use the money to build. So when you very first start a business, Michael, when you very first start one, you don't have any profit to realize. You haven't built anything yet. So you can't pull money out of it yet. The only option is to build. So if you consider just like a profit loss statement as being success versus failure, then yeah, every business is going to fail for some period of time at the start you have to put some amount of money forward, right? You have to put some amount of money forward so you lose right at the beginning. The question of how long you lose, if that's the way that you consider it, is dependent on your definition of failure, right? So when you're adjusting for the idea of risk with that, you need to understand that the realization of risk, whenever bad things happen in your business, this is not a like needless exchange. This is not a straight loss. Whenever we get scammed by a supplier, it's a benefit for our business. It knocks one person off of the list that we would otherwise be using for product. It narrows down our supplier pool until we're left with something like subsection has, which is we can source virtually any product at virtually any price. We know exactly where to get it. We know all the best suppliers in the industry, and we're able to get these products at well under market value. The only way that we were able to do that was by getting scammed a fuck ton. So again, do you look at getting scammed as being a loss? Do you look at that as being a failure? 
because I look at that as being a step closer to success. And you're exactly right, Dan. This is that example of there's no L's, only lessons. So it depends on how you identify success versus failure. Very, very, very good question. And then Jays B asked uh, for the difference between an LLC and an S Corp, right? Um, so whenever we're talking about the difference between LLCs versus corporations, um, we're, we're kind of talking about a difference in the way that the business is structured. So LLC stands for Limited Liability Company, right? Limited Liability Company. And the easiest way to break this down is to talk about three things. The first one is a sole proprietorship, the second one is an LLC, and the third one is a corporation. So in a sole proprietorship, you are the business for all intents and purposes, right? In the eyes of the government, you, as Shazeb, you are your business. So if your business causes a damage to somebody, you are causing that damage to somebody. So you get sued. It is your assets that are being sued. If your business makes money, that means you are making money. So you are the one that pays taxes. If your business suffers a loss, that means that you suffered a loss. Therefore, you are entitled to whatever compensation or recompense there is for that. Does that make sense what a sole proprietorship is? Sole proprietorship just means you are the business. Okay, the next step up from that is an LLC, a limited liability company. This is essentially the same thing as a sole proprietorship, but you're adding one layer of protection in front of yourself. So the government still sees it as a pass-through entity in terms of money, meaning if an LLC makes money, you are making money, right? If an LLC loses money, you are are losing money. An LLC is not a separate taxable entity, right? It's not its own thing in the eyes of the government. It's basically a bulletproof vest. Here's where that protection comes in. Let's say you cause somebody a damage and you own an LLC. That's the point where that protection steps in. The LLC limits your liability. So whenever somebody comes to sue for that damage, they can't come after your personal assets they have to come after the business's assets. So they can't come after the money in your bank account, they have to come after the business bank account. They can't come after your car, they have to come after the business's car. It basically limits your liability in terms of damages. Now, this only extends to the operation of justifiable business practices. So, Let's say, for example, I operate a tree cutting business. I go around and I cut down trees, right? If in the due course of my business, if I use the best practices as a tree cutter and I accidentally cause somebody a damage, then my LLC protects me. But let's say my neighbor Bob is a douchebag and so I cut down a tree and knock it onto his house. That was not the due course of doing business, so my LLC doesn't protect me. So it's similar to what we look at with MANA, right? In the case of MANA, MANA was not operating a justifiable business. MANA was scamming people. Kenny was scamming people. So his LLC does not protect him in this case because this was not his business that accidentally caused somebody a damage. This was intentionally causing people a damage. Does this kind of make sense? So an LLC limits your liability, whereas a sole proprietorship does not. So does an LLC make sense? Yes, okay. And then finally, we have an S Corp or a regular corporation. A corporation is its own entity. How does LLC taxation work? In the United States, an LLC is a pass-through entity, meaning income from an LLC is passed through to the owner or owners, right? So if your LLC shows $100,000 in profit and you're the only owner of that LLC, that means that you pay $100,000 worth of taxes, right? So you're not taxed twice, that's exactly right. You are not taxed twice. 
an LLC in the United States is a pass-through entity in terms of taxation, right? Now, a corporation is its own separate entity. The federal government in the United States views a corporation as an entirely separate entity in every way, shape, and form except for the right to vote and the right to bear arms, right? Those are the only two things that the federal government distinguishes as being different between a corporation and a person. So let's say a corporation causes somebody a damage. Let's say my corporation kills somebody. The owners of that corporation go to prison. And it doesn't matter if they were the ones to pull the trigger. It doesn't matter if they were involved in the crime. It is the owners of that corporation that go to prison, right? It is the managing partners of that that are liable for it. Or if that corporation accidentally causes somebody a damage, the same protection as an LLC applies, right? So a corporation is its own entirely separate entity. That means that a corporation pays taxes. That means that a corporation has other civic responsibilities. That means that a corporation can break the law. It means that a corporation can be taken to court, right? Where an LLC cannot be. An LLC is just a pass-through entity, and a sole proprietorship is the person. So does this kind of help you understand the differences? Where a corporation, in the S and S corporation just stands for small. It's just a different distinguishment of like a business where um, like the S just stands for like small corporation, uh, meaning it's not like uh, there's not like a bunch of different equity holders. There's not shares, things like that. That kind of makes sense. It does. So overall, an LLC would be better. It depends on kind of where you are in business. So a lot of people make the mistake by thinking that like, oh, if I'm doing like a shit ton of like business, then I should be a corporation. If I'm doing a medium amount of business, I should be an LLC. And if I'm not doing that much business, I should be a sole proprietor. That's not the way that you should look at it. So the way that you should look at it, let's say that you are a designer, right? You are a designer and you design jewelry, let's just say. If that's the case, if that's your business, you designing jewelry, and the designs are yours, regardless of whether you do $100 in business or $10 million in business, you should be a sole proprietorship because you are the business, right? So for all intents and purposes, you are always a sole proprietorship regardless of how much money you're doing, right? Regardless of how much business you're doing. Can you repeat that last sentence? Regardless of how much business you're doing, if you are the business, you should be a sole proprietorship. So let's say you're a comedian, right? You do road tours and things like that. You should be a sole proprietorship. You should never go towards an LLC. You should never go into being a corporation. There's no point in doing so. You aren't going to cause anybody a damage by being a comedian, so you don't need the extra protection that an LLC offers, and it's still a pass-through entity in terms of like financials, in terms of tax, so there's no purpose in being an LLC. And in fact, in being a sole proprietor, you allow yourself to be compensated for certain damages or losses as yourself personally without things becoming assets of the business. So let's say, for example, that you are a comedian and a show promoter screws you over. Now you are suing that show promoter. And when that show promoter has to pay a judgment against you, that is your money. That's your money. Whereas if you had an LLC and the show promoter screwed that LLC out of the money, then your LLC would have to sue the show promoter. And any money that was issued by the court would be the property of the LLC. That LLC would pass through money to you, meaning you pay taxes on it. Meanwhile, court settlements are not usually taxable. So in that case, you should be a sole proprietorship, right? Let's say you're in a business that might cause somebody a damage. Let's say you're a construction worker or you are somebody who operates a tree business, maybe even a cleaning business, right? At that point, an LLC makes a lot of sense because you have higher liabilities and you want to limit those liabilities for yourself. 
And then finally, let's say you're a business that's going to require lots of capital from lots of different people. You're going to have essentially a lot of different business partners. There's a lot of people putting money in and there's a lot of people taking money out like Amazon or Apple or Walmart. If that's the case, you should probably be a corporation because you are no longer the business. The business is totally dissociated from you. It is its own entity. And at that point, you would identify as a corporation. Make sense? <laughs> so what about a cook group owner? Uh, what would be the best way to go? LLC, I'm assuming? Probably an LLC for resellers. Probably an LLC. See you, Michael. Have a great first day at work. Okay, so finally, let's talk about taxes. Let's talk about taxes. Is Cadio a corporation? Yes, Cadio is a corporation because we have a lot of people that take money out and we also have a lot of businesses under our purview. Cadio is not just me. Cadio is a bunch of different people, right? So because I, even though I'm the face of it, because I'm pretty dissociated from it, we identify it as a corporation. Okay, so... Let's talk about taxes. And to kind of preface all of this, I want to say here, I am not a lawyer. I am not an accountant. You should not take anything I say as a supplement to or as a complement to advice from a licensed professional. I am not a licensed professional. Okay? This is not financial advice. This is not legal advice. So, all right. Here's the first thing you should understand about taxes here in the United States. You only pay taxes on your net profits. You only pay taxes on your net profits. Let me repeat. You only pay taxes on your net profits. Let me repeat. You only pay taxes on your net profits. Remember, net profit is the amount of money when everything is all said and done that you ended up making as a business. You only pay taxes on your net profits. So net profits subtract all of these different costs of doing business, right? Here's where a lot of you fuck up in terms of taxes. A lot of you get scared when StockX or Goat or Grailed or Mercari or whatever asks for your social security number so that they can report your earnings to the IRS. You guys get scared when that happens. Let me ask you a question. Does StockX know how much you paid for your cell phone? Does StockX know how much you paid for your cell phone? Does StockX know how much you paid for the sneakers that you sold? Does StockX know how much you paid for storage? Does StockX know how much those sneakers depreciated? Do they know how much you paid for packaging? Do they know how much you paid for your shipping label? Do they know how much you paid in gas to get to the shipping carrier? Do they know what your time was worth to follow up with the customer? No, 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 right? So StockX does not know what your tax liability is. They don't know what you owe in taxes. They can't report what you owe in taxes. All they're reporting is your revenue. You could sell a million dollars of sneakers in StockX and not have to pay a single cent in tax. I'll repeat, you could sell a million dollars worth of sneakers on StockX and not have to pay a single cent in tax. It all comes down to your net profits. We only pay taxes on our net profits. And the only way the government knows about those net profits is if you tell them. You have to tell them what you paid and they have to either be told or you have to tell them what you earned. Does StockX know how many pairs of sneakers you sold in person? No. So you guys fuck up here. You think that you're going to have to pay taxes on every single sale that you make on one of these platforms once they have your tax ID. And that's just not the case. They're just reporting how much came in from their platform. The rest of it is between you and the government. And the honest truth, is that StockX doesn't give a fuck how much you owe in taxes. They really don't care. They're never going to care. That's not their thing. They don't care about that, right? Hold on one second. Oh my God. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, 
they don't know how much you owe in taxes. They don't know how much you're going to have to pay in taxes. So whenever they are reporting your earnings, they're reporting your revenue from their platform. They're reporting your revenue from their platform. They don't know what your profit is. Only you know what your profit is. And you only pay taxes on your net profits. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. So to understand taxes here, we've got to understand a couple of vocab words. And I'm going to burn through these pretty quickly because this has already gone on for some time. Your tax liability versus your taxable income. Since there's so many write-off expenses, would you say it's pretty easy to break even? Yeah. In fact, I'd say a lot of people do break even. And it's pretty simple to tell too, David, because you're probably looking at your bank account saying there's not that much more in it than there was at this point last year. And if that's the case, chances are you kind of broke even business-wise. You know what I mean? Now, sure, you might have taken out little bits here and there to pay for like DoorDash or to pay your rent or anything like that. But it's not like you took out $100,000 and you're going to have to pay $100,000 worth of taxes, even if you sold $100,000 worth of shoes. Because a lot of us are building equity in our businesses, right? We are kind of breaking even while we're building that ownership in our brand. So with that being the case, a lot of us have very low, very low tax liabilities. Okay, so let's talk about these definitions here. Your tax liability is the amount of money you owe to the government in taxes. Your taxable income is the amount of money you earned that you need to pay taxes on. So let me give you an example here. Let's say over the course of one year, after everything was all said and done, you had a net profit of $30,000 in your business. Okay? We can find information here pretty quickly. I can't pull it up on my screen right now because I have another tab open. But we can find what the tax bracket is. So I'm going to look it up on my phone, right? I'm going to come to Google and I'm going to type in tax brackets 2023. And I'm going to click through to irs.gov. And I'm just looking for the tax brackets here. Let's see here. Okay, so for incomes over $11,000, but below 44725 so that's us, it would be 12%. So our taxable income, our net profits for our entire business were $30,000. We would have to pay 12% of that in tax. That's $3,600. So our taxable income was $30,000. Our tax liability was 3600 Does this definition make sense? Does this definition make sense? Here's another place where people get confused is the idea of a write-off. A write-off. So, a lot of you know that you can write off the cost of the sneakers, right? You can write off the cost of your sneakers. When you buy sneakers to resell them, you can write off the cost of the sneakers. That's pretty dope, right? But unfortunately, a lot of you think about it this way. You think, oh, I owe $3,600 in taxes. I spent $2,000 on sneakers. That means I only have to pay $1,600 in taxes. That's not how it works. A write-off comes off of your taxable income. Tax credit comes off of your tax liability. Once again, a write-off comes off of your taxable income. Your tax credit comes off of your tax liability. So let me show you here. In the above example, we had $30,000 in profits, right? Let's say over the course of that year, we spent $15,000 on sneakers, right? So we are subtracting that $15,000 this leaves us with $15,000 in net profits. Now we have our 12% times 0.12 and we owe $1,800 in taxes. Does this make sense? Now, there are certain things that you can do that help you to earn tax credits. So for example, if you buy an electric vehicle here in the United States and use it for business purposes like my Tesla, you get a tax credit. 
for an amount of the purchase price of that vehicle. Tax credit straight up comes off of your tax liability. It's not just writing off the cost of the vehicle. It's taking a percentage of that vehicle and getting to write it off of the actual tax liability. So let's say I grossed $30,000 in net profits. My tax liability here would be 3,600 bucks. But now let's say I get a 10% tax credit on my Tesla. Let's say I paid 30 grand for the car. That means I get to subtract $3,000 here. Does this make sense? Write-offs come off of your taxable income. Tax credit comes off of your tax liability. Yes, is that every year as long as you have the car? Not here in the United States. It's a one-time tax credit. Okay. And then finally, finally, we have this idea of income tax versus capital gains. How many of you guys have heard of capital gains before? You guys probably hear this as being rich people talk, right? Whenever you think about capital gains, you probably think about rich people, right? Yeah, with stocks and shit, right? The only thing that capital gains means is that you used money to make money. That's all it means. You used money to make money. So, could I use a premium NFT as a write-off? Unfortunately not. The federal government does not recognize cryptocurrency as being like an actual asset. So you can't, your business can't own it. It can't be a business asset. So unfortunately not. But because of that, um, you also don't have to claim your cryptocurrency as income because it's not recognized as being a real thing until you turn it into cash. Okay. So anyway, capital gains just means that you used your money to make money. So let's say I spend $1,000 buying stocks and then I sell those stocks and I have $1,500. This means that I have $500 of capital gains. I have $500 of capital gains. Isn't that cool? So capital gains are typically taxed at a lower rate than income tax. It's a different tax bracket. It's a different way of doing things. There's also short-term capital gains versus long-term capital gains. It's a whole thing. It's a whole system. You can learn all about it. But essentially, when you are using your money to make money, instead of just taking that money and spending it, you get to pay less in tax. So how many of you guys have heard that Jeff Bezos doesn't have to pay like any tax? How many of you guys have heard that Jeff Bezos doesn't pay like hardly any tax? Yet he's like one of the richest man, richest men in the world. How many of you guys have heard that? Yeah, yeah, and it's true, right? Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, hardly pays anything in tax. Why is that? Well, he's not taking money out of Amazon, at least not very much. He takes out like $60,000 a year in actual money. What he really takes out of this business is mostly stock. That stock is not money, therefore it is not taxable, right? Instead, whenever he sells that stock, whenever he gets the money out of it, that's the point where he'll pay the tax. And when he pays that tax, he's not paying that as income, he's paying it as capital gains. See what I mean? So there's a difference here, right? There's a difference here, and he'll end up paying less in tax by having sold the stock or held on to it, right? By essentially having bought the stock. Is that what level you're on, Mike? Kind of, sort of. I do it more with real estate than I do it with stock, but point being the same, yes. Every rich person loves capital gains, and what we really love is long-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains is pretty much income tax. It's taxed at pretty much the same rate, but long-term capital gains, oh, mama, taxed at like 10%, right? My tax bracket normally would be over 30%. When I translate it to capital gains, it's like 10. It's correct. It's really, really, really good. Okay. So with all of this in mind, let's recap. In terms of taxes, should you guys ever be worried when you get one of those tax forms from PayPal or StockX or anything like that? No, because we only pay taxes on our net profits. And those platforms do not know our net profits. The only person who knows them is you. And it's your responsibility to report them. 
your tax liability is the amount of money you're actually paying to the government in tax. Your taxable income is the amount of money that you made free and clear after all the expenses of your business. All of the expenses of your business will be write-offs for your business. And sometimes you might earn tax credit, which will be an amount of money that comes off of your tax liability. You will also, as an LLC owner or as a sole proprietorship, be paying income tax, probably not capital gains, until you start using your money to make money. Does all of this make sense for you guys? Yes. Perfect, perfect. In which case, I'm going to end the recording